So there's a quote there from a guy called Jason Dorsey. Now, he, if you haven't come across him, he's based in the States, and he talks an awful lot about millennials and Generation Z. And this is what he had to say about technology, and it's quite interesting. Um, so it's only, technology is only new if you can remember what it was like before. So think about that. And looking around the audience, there's a few people here who are old enough like me to remember that, um, that brick phone. Um, hands up who can remember, who can remember this? Yeah. Oh, okay, most of you. All right. Yeah. So, so we'll all remember what the cassette player and what the pencil was uh, was for. So, um, think about what I'm trying to do is just set the context for what we're talking about about us as the new consumer, uh, because I think you'll agree that we we've, we've all changed. We changed. We probably haven't realised it, but we we changed over the last 10, 12 years. And I'm going to point out some of the. the um, uh, the milestones, if you like, along the way that I believe have changed us because this has profound implications for brands and for retailers. So before I go any further, just want to, because I don't know about you, but there's an awful lot of hype and frankly nonsense talked about retail. And there's a lot of terminology which actually is pretty meaningless. So I just want to talk about a few of those things first. So this is the first one. Now, I reckon we probably all use this term. I've been guilty of it. Um, does anybody know when and where it was coined and how long ago? Well, I, I had a look at it, and there's a guy called Darren Rigby, who I'm sure you've never heard of, but Darren did a piece for the Harvard Business Review, and that was back in 2011. And what he was trying to do by using this term omnichannel was to try to describe, if you like, the relationship between the physical and the digital. Something which you know, an awful lot is talked about, and again, there's an awful lot of nonsense talked about it. But basically for me, it's all one thing. It's this, it's shopping. So we all shop and we shop from here, and traditionally we used to shop from here, um, but we also shop from here as well. And the point is that I think now we do it without consciously thinking about the difference. And but but you know you, you hear a lot of people talking about it still in channels. We don't we don't think in channels. We just go shopping. You know we don't say, oh I'm just popping out to do a bit of omni-channel. We go shopping, and it doesn't really matter where it is. Next thing I really wanted to, uh, which kind of leads on from that last one, and I think I'm going to take this off. We'll stick with we'll stick with the this one here. So um, what I'm going to try to to show is that through our behaviour, we're the biggest disruptors. Not technology, not Amazon, not eBay, not anybody else. It, it's us. It's our demands and our expectations. So if you think about your own uh, shopping habits, behaviours, and if you've got particularly teenage or even younger children. Think about the way that they use their smartphone, the way that they expect to engage and interact with brands and with retailers. And that's, that's a big insight into how we've changed. If we look at in-store for a second, if you're still selling stuff, and by, what I mean by that is you're just putting the product on the shelves, you're opening the doors, and you're expecting people to come in and buy it. Well, that isn't the case anymore. I think we probably all know that. We, you know, again, I, I, I really don't like the phrase experiential retail, but unfortunately, we all know what I'm referring to. And I think it is the truth that the, the whole experience, particularly when we're shopping in store, is the most important thing now. Price and product and availability, we probably take as a given, but it's that whole experience and it's the memory of the experience which is the most important thing. And if you don't believe me, and the sad thing about this, and it's sad because of the jobs that are lost, um, I could have put up probably another three or four slides with different brands, just happened to choose these. However, there's no retail apocalypse. Um, 
I'm not one of these people who uh, subscribes to the narrative about the death of the high street. And again, if you read the popular press and if you believe what they have to say with their headlines, uh, which is basically clickbait, um, you know, you might be forgiven for thinking. But in actual fact, you know, in many ways, retail could be said to be in very good health. I don't think if any retailers here, they'll probably agree with that because it's very hard work and we know that it's very challenging and there's a lot of external factors which are coming to bear. And by the way, I'm not about to mention the B word, so don't worry. Um, but it's a fact that things are changing, things are evolving. It's what I refer to as Darwinism on the high street. So um, what people have to understand is that there is change there and the old ways of working are no longer fit for purpose. So I used to work uh, at Kingfisher many years ago and I think they're quite typical, many, many retailers which are organized in a particular way. It's a particular siloed, vertical, command and control from the center point of view. Now, if you look at some of the much, much younger startups who are typically probably online, they don't operate in the same way and they certainly don't use the same sort of language. And the, the fact of the matter is that retail simply isn't keeping up the, the pace of innovation within retail for various reasons, which I won't go into today. But the fact of the matter is that the pace of retail innovation just simply isn't keeping up with us. We're, if you like, that, that cloud of dust over the, over the horizon. Um, we're, we're, we're gone, we're, you know, in, in terms of our expectations, we want more and more and more. Um, I'll come on to delivery a little bit later, but just to say that, you know, it used to be that, what, 72 hour delivery was acceptable, 48 hour? I don't know what you expect, but it's certainly now probably going to be next day, maybe even same day. And I would suggest that within a very short space of time, it's going to be within the hour. And again, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, anybody know where, where this is, has a guess where this is? It's a bit blurry because it's taken a long time ago. Okay, so that's Selfridges, yep. Um, and Selfridges opened in 1909. I think this picture was taken in 1910. Um, this picture was taken two, two and a half years ago. Um, now, I'm not picking on Selfridges because I happen to think it's a fantastic brand, a fantastic retailer. But the point I'm trying to make is that for the best part of 100 years, retail simply hasn't changed. It's pretty much the same. Then something happened in August 1991. Does anybody can remember what that, what that was? Okay, something called the internet. So that was August 1991 that that became available. So that was three years before Amazon was born. And it was about 15, something like that, 14, before uh, Facebook, uh, 16 before Twitter, and the best part of 18 before Instagram. So a lot has happened over the last 20 years. And we, I think what we, we kind of fall into the trap that we... Uh, we take things a little bit for granted in terms of what we've got now, and it's quite good. And what I like to do is just kind of take a step back and reflect on what's happened in a relatively short space of time, and then to not go forward too far, because if I go forward too far, I could say whatever I like, and you, and, you, know, you couldn't argue with me. But if we look ahead without crystal balling, if the rate of change continues, then you know, who knows what, what we're gonna uh, find in the next five, seven years or so. So, I mentioned a couple of um, milestones. Um, let's take a swig of this. And they happened within about a year of each other, about 12 years ago. So the first of these, and I think we probably all know who that is. So, in January 2007, Steve Jobs got up at Macworld, which is the annual Apple bash in uh, California, and he announced the launch of a new iPod. Yeah, we remember the, the iPod, yeah? 
a new phone and something which he described as an internet communicator device. Now there's a video on YouTube of this and it's about an hour or so long. You don't need to see, and you can just search Steve Jobs, Macworld, it'll come up. Just watch the first 10 minutes of it, because it's quite fascinating. So he said it again, and he said, we're launching a new iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator device. And again, there was pretty much no reaction within the audience. And clearly what they thought they'd come along was to see the launch of three new products. And he said it again, and he said it, it's a new iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator, and then you could see the penny started to drop. And of course, what he was announcing was the launch of the first iPhone. So that was January 2007. So why have I picked that out? Well, what that did, and again, think about your own behaviors and that of your children and friends and so on and so forth. What that did was that gave us, all of us as consumers, the power in our pockets. So think about the relationship that we used to have with brands and with retailers. It was quite kind of parent-child, with the retailer being the parent. They were, they were kind of dictating to a large extent. Think about it today. So at the time, back in 2007, we didn't really realize what had been put in our pockets, but we certainly do so now. Now, the second event, which happened, which really kind of cemented that, if you like, was the global financial crisis. So that was September, this headline is from September 2008. And for me, what that, that did was that gave us the incentive. So there's the old cliche about, you never used to see a BMW or a Mercedes in a little or an Audi car park. And to an extent, it was kind of true. In as much as demographically, if we were in certain groups, you know, the A's and maybe the B's, probably wouldn't be seen there or in a pound shop or anything like that. Now think again about that today, and it's completely different. And I think what's happened is that you know, we, we would go in to one of these and we might be wearing a very expensive watch or driving an expensive car, but we still feel that that's being smart, that's being savvy. And so our shopping habits changed pretty much irreversibly. So the first gave us the power and the second gave us the incentive. I think that's fundamental and I don't see that change, I just see that trend uh, accelerating, if anything else. And what that did, um, particularly with the birth of the social media networks, I said earlier, you know, Facebook was 2004, I think Twitter was a couple of years later, and then Instagram a few years after that. So again, if you think about it, none of them have been around for that long, but they seem to be fairly well established in our lives as if they've been around forever, but in actual fact, they're in their infancy. But we all became broadcasters. So that, that smartphone in our pockets gave us that ability whenever and wherever we are. And there are plenty of examples, which I won't go into here, but I'm sure you, you can think of uh, them yourselves, where events now are broadcast live, it's us doing it through our, through our phones. And what's more, we expect to be heard, we expect to have a voice. So we expect to be able to interact and engage with our favorite brands, and we expect them to respond to that. I don't know how many of you have, I guess it usually comes when we're complaining, when we're saying something negative about a brand, and whether you use Twitter or whatever other social media, you probably expect to have some sort of response. And when you don't get it, you might feel quite irritated by that. And of course, I kept this in, even though we saw the news on, whenever it was, Monday, that maybe things aren't quite so easy for Uber in London, but I kept it in because it, it, it still makes the point that we want and we expect everything to be so easy now. I don't use the word frictionless and seamless because, again, I, I put them in the bucket along with experiential and omnichannel, but you know what I mean. And I used to use a slide here and I had a picture of a... Of a of a goldfish. Yeah, and we all know the thing about a goldfish has got an eight second attention span. How they measure that, I don't know, but it's got an eight second attention span and apparently ours is less than that. But what I prefer to say is that we've all, all of us have developed our own personal digital filter. 
because we're bombarded. You know, you probably were on the journey here today. You know, we're all bombarded with digital content. So for brands and for retailers, they've somehow got to get past that. And traditional direct marketing methods don't necessarily work anymore. And I would suggest that that, that filter is about two to three seconds. So in other words, if somebody's trying to grab your attention with whatever it happens to be, but let's say it's a new product or whatever, then they've got about two to three seconds to do that. And if they don't, then you're gonna move on somewhere else. And it's very easy to do that. And we do it without even thinking. And this is one which um, a lot of people actually disagree with, but I still maintain that brand loyalty today in general does not exist the way it used to. Now, hands up, I've been talking about smartphones, so hands up, who has an iPhone? Yeah, so that's pretty much typical. So I, whenever I, I, I do this talk, I ask the audience that, and it's nearly always two thirds, that was about two thirds to three quarters have an iPhone. So I would suggest that you're probably quite loyal to, to Apple and they've done a good job of that. And you could go down Regent Street and walk into their store there and you could walk in, they'll punch you in the face and you would still love Apple. Um, there's one or two others, I think Nike will probably go in, in the same category. But generally, we don't feel the same way towards brands that we used to. We don't have that sense of guilt, if you like. And, and, and so our behavior is what I call butterfly consumerism. So we land on a brand and we'll land there and we're loyal at the time of transaction, but then we'll move on to another one. We might come back to it. Um, and if we have a really great experience, we might tell our friends and family about that. But generally, we're not loyal in the way that we used to be because we're now much, much smarter, much more savvy as consumers. What I'm going to do now, so what I've tried to do there is just sort of set the context and set the scene um, and talk a little bit about what we, all of us, are like now as consumers and how we're very different. And you know, I haven't, I haven't talked about personalization, for example, because that's a whole different subject and could take up you know, an hour. Um, but the implications are there for retailers and some, as we've seen, some get it, some clearly don't, and they're not around anymore. And that's the evolving of the high street. So what I'm gonna do now is, is take you through a few examples from around the world and these are examples of what is happening to try to, if you like, fulfill that desire, that expectation that we've got. And all of these are either in production or they're in trial and just about to, to go live. So there's, there's no sort of blue sky you know, stuff here. It, it's all real and you can feel and touch it and so on and so forth. So the first I just want to talk about something and it, it, it kind of probably looks you know, fairly uninspiring, but when I explain what this is and what the implications of it are, then perhaps you know, hopefully you'll feel a little bit different. So this is an Israeli outfit uh, based in Tel Aviv. And this is, it was a disused underground car park in a tower block in Tel Aviv. And what they've done is they built a, an automated fulfillment center in this, in this car park. And what they're doing is they're building a platform which they can then sell to, to retailers. But the point of differentiation here is that this can go into a, very, a relatively very small space. So it can scale down to around about 4,000 square feet. And the other thing about this is it's designed for one hour delivery. So this particular one, they're gearing up for grocery. So it's gonna be ambient, chilled, um, frozen. Um, doesn't have to be grocery, but this particular one is. And their, their model is to have a kind of like a hub and spoke so that you can, you can um, so I think each has a radius of around about five kilometers. So you can pretty much um, cover a whole city. Um, so think, think about that in terms of your expectation of what you perhaps want. You may say, well, I don't need anything within the hour, but 
there are probably going to be times when you do, or certainly there, there could well be a demand for that. So again, think about the empty spaces on the high street. We've still got plenty of empty British home stores. One of these could go into that, and you have many fulfillment centers on the high street. So that's um, common sense to now rebrand as fabric. This is again an example of that, that, that trend towards the speed of fulfillment. So this is matchesfashion.com. And they say if you've got, um, if you're in London, if you're in central London, then order now and you're wearing it within 90 minutes. So another really interesting example of fulfilling this, this desire which we've, now, which we've now got. And another one here from Czechoslovakian uh, retail called Zoot. And they say if you order before 9 a.m., then it'll be delivered by 12 o'clock. You can try it on and the delivery driver will wait and take back the returns, what you don't need. Just an interesting take on, uh, on the same thing. Anybody here from Milton Keynes? Have you seen one of these? Yep, okay, so, so this is Starship Technologies. Um, I think originally they, um, they formed in Tallinn in Estonia, but they're mainly in California now. So these, these are, as you can see, automated uh, robots, so they deliver. It, this is live on a university campus in California taking books and lunches to students around the campus. Now, I can see this sort of thing, um, and I don't know how many of them you've seen around Milton Keynes, but you know, this, I think, in certain use cases, is very probable. Um, automated cars, I don't think are going to happen anytime soon, if for no other reason than the algorithm as to who dies in an accident hasn't yet been worked out. You know, does that look like a mother with a baby in her arms? And do I have to, do I avoid her at all costs to the detriment of my passengers? You know, so I don't see automated vehicles uh, for quite some time, but I think these, yes. Now this is something that I think again is quite is quite interesting. And again the implications um, are are quite far reaching. So this is Sinow, who are Alibaba's logistics arm. So they trialed this. It hasn't gone into production yet, but this is basically a secure locker. You have it outside your home. You can control it as it shows there with the facial recognition, but it's controlled remotely via an app. So you can change the temperature. So if you've got food delivered, let's say it's cold and you want to keep it cold, you can change the temperature, or if it's hot, you can keep it hot. So just think, if we all had one of these or something similar outside our homes, click and collect would die overnight. Think about the implications for the supply chain. You know, every retailer I talk to, and um, much of their investment is going into the supply chain, so that, and this kind of is kind of counterintuitive to what I've just been saying, but with one of these, we don't necessarily have to have that one hour delivery. We don't necessarily need, because we don't need to be in, it could be that two days is quite sufficient. So if we have one of these, then all that pressure and strain on the supply chain just evaporates overnight. Interesting. The commercial model hasn't been worked out yet. There was a company a few years ago who was a startup in this country called Pelipod, if anybody's heard of them. Well, that, that didn't work there. I think they were charging a subscription of 9.99 a month. Uh, didn't take off, but BT bought it and they've got hundreds of them around the country which are used as spares boxes for their engineers. So the concept, albeit in a different use case, is, is still working. So delivery matters, and if for the back you can't see that, it said, yeah, leave under the doormat. And that's exactly what the delivery driver did. So the point I'm making here is, I would suggest that in the next few years, delivery is going to come to define brands. In other words, brands retail's capability to deliver. So we're not going to see those boxes outside our homes for the foreseeable future. So their ability to deliver where and whenever we want, 
will come to define their success or failure. And that is why we're seeing an awful lot of investment in supply chain, in demand management, in inventory management, these sorts of things. I haven't mentioned artificial intelligence, so I better do so now. Um, suffice to say that over the next few years, AI will be pretty much embedded in nearly every part of a, of a retail organization, from the back office, supply chain, uh, right through to, to the store. Certainly, we know it's in online, it's in call centers, but we're going to see more and more. This, I thought, was quite an interesting example. So Procter & Gamble, who own the Oral-B brand, um, if you want to fork out £179.99 for a toothbrush, then you got more money than cents probably, but um, you can get one of these and it's supposedly powered by AI and it will map how you brush your teeth and then it will make suggestions for how you do it more efficiently. Whether we're going to see these, I'm not sure, but I think we're certainly going to see AI in pretty much every part of retail. A couple of examples here from um, stores. Um, so this is Canada Goose, their flagship in Montreal. And for me, this is a great example of in-store customer experience. Because it's very simple, very straightforward, doesn't rely on technology, unless you call a deep freeze technology. So instead of saying, well, yeah, our jacket does this and will keep you warm down to such and such a temperature, they invite you to put it on and walk inside the freezer, which goes down to minus 25, and then you'll find out for yourself whether it does what it says on the tin. So for me, I think that's a great, very easy, very simple example of what great in-store experience is. The other one which has opened, um, this opened a few weeks ago, uh, Puma, a flagship store on Fifth Avenue. It's actually um, in conjunction with a, a client of, uh, of ours, um, Green Room Design, who worked with them. And they created this, and it's called the Skill Cube. So they've used the Puma Ambassadors. So they've got a couple of footballers. Can't remember the names. They've also got, because I'm into motor racing, they, I remember Lewis Hamilton. So they've got him as well. And you can, in virtual uh, reality, if you like, uh, you can go and have a, a training session with them. Um, it is apparently, I'll be there in January and I'll have a look at it myself, but it's apparently very, very lifelike. That's five million blades of grass and they all move individually. So you're in here, you're in the San Siro Stadium. It's a capacity crowd of 80,000. You're having a training session with your football stars. And by the way, each one of those 80,000 people in the crowd moves independently, individually. So it's a very, very real, lifelike. And what Puma are trying to do is to engage what they call their fans, it's not their customers, it's their fans. They're trying to engage them in their brands and get that engagement with them. You know, again, it's not something they're going to roll out to every store, but it's just an example of how they're crossing that. So it's not just a static store. It's something that you actually become part of. Now, the one question, just before I uh, finish up, the one question that probably I get asked the most um, in terms of what retailers need to need to do and be aware of and focus on. And it comes down to one word. And as I said earlier, I haven't really mentioned personalization, but we're kind of touching on it now. Um, and the one word is be relevant. Be relevant with your customers and in the moment. And if you're not, this is what happens. I'll let you read it. It was from April last year. You can probably see it went and it had nearly 400,000 likes. Um, and this is somebody who they happened to buy a toilet seat, happened to be off Amazon. We know what happens when we buy something. We get all those emails coming back to us and so on and so forth. And she really didn't want to know a toilet seat. Just wanted the one, thank you very much. So I think the message is no personalization is better than poor personalization. If you enjoyed my ramblings, then 
Um, please go out and buy my book. Um, Harry was right all along. As you may have guessed, the Harry was Harry Selfridge, because I used him as an example earlier on, but I happen to think that they're fantastic. And if you do look at the things that he was saying 100 years ago, they're as relevant today as they ever were. So thank you very much. Apologies for the sound problems earlier on. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.